Chapter 27. The 13th of October continued. The clock in the council chamber struck nine. Well, said Lord, Car Lord Carterham, with a deep sigh. Here they all are, just like little Bo Peep's flock, back again and wagging their tails behind them. He looked sadly round the room. Organ grinder complete with monkey, he murmured, fixing the bright baron with his eye. Nosy Parker of Thormaginton Street. I think you're rather unkind to the Baron, protested Bundle, to whom these confidences were being poured out. He told me that he considered you the perfect example of English hospitality amongst the hot noblesse. I dare say, said Lord Carterham, he's always saying things like that. It makes him most fatiguing to talk to but I can tell you I'm not nearly as much of the hospi hospitable English gentleman as I was. As soon as I can, I shall let chimneys to an enterprising American and go on and live in a hotel. There, if anyone worries you, you can ju just ask for your bill and go. Cheer up, said Bundle. We seem to have lost Mr. Fish for good. I always found him rather amusing, said Lord Carterham, who was in a contradictory temper. It's that precious young man of yours who has let me in for this. Why should I have this board meeting called to my house? Why doesn't he rent the largest of Elmhurst or some nice villa residence like that at Streatham and hold his company meetings there? Wrong atmosphere, said Bundle. No one is going to play any tricks on us, I hope, said her father nervously. I don't trust that French fellow, Lemoyne. The French police are up to all sorts of dodges. Put India rubber bands around your arm and then reconstruct the crime and make you jump. And it's registered on a thermometer. I know that when they call out, who killed Prince Michael? I shall register 122 or something perfectly frightful and they'll haul me off to Gal at once. The door opened and Treadwell announced, Mr. George Lomax, Mr. George Lomax, Mr. Eversley. Enter Cotters, followed by faithful dog, murmured Bendel. Bill made a beeline for her whilst George, gre George greeted Lord Carterham in the genial manner he assumed for public occasions. My dear Carterham, said George, shaking him by the hand, I got your message and came over, of course. Very good of you, my dear fellow, very good of you. Delighted to see you. Lord Carterham's conscience always drove him up to an excess of geniality when he was conscious of feeling none. Not that it was my message, but that doesn't matter at all. In the meantime, Bill was attacking Bundle in an undertone. I say, what's it all about? What's this I hear about Virginia bolting off in the middle of the night? She's not been kidnapped, has she? Oh, no, said Bundle. She left a note pinned to the pincushion in the orthodox fashion. She's not gone off with anyone, has she? Not with that Colonel Johnny. I never liked the fellow, and from all I hear, there seems to be an idea floating around that he himself is the super crook. But I don't quite see how that could be. Why not? Well, this King Victor was a French fellow, and Cade's English enough. You don't happen to have heard that King Victor was an accomplished linguist, and moreover was half Irish. Oh, Lord, then that's why he's made himself scarce, is it? I don't know about his making himself scarce. He disappeared the day before yesterday, as you know. But this morning we got a wire from him saying he would be down here at 9 p.m. tonight and suggesting that Cotter should be asked over. All these other people have turned up as well, asked by Mr. Cade. It is a gathering, said Bill, looking round. One French detective by window, one English ditto by fireplace, strong foreign element. The stars and stripes don't do seem to be represented. Bundle shook her head. Mr. Fish has disappeared into the blue. Virginia's not here either. But everyone else is assembled, and I have a feeling in my bones, Bill, that we are drawing very near to the moment when somebody says, James the Footman, and everything is revealed. We're only waiting now for Anthony Cade to arrive. He'll never show up, said Bill. Then why call this company meeting, as father calls it? Ah, uh, there's some deep idea behind that. Depend upon it. Once it's all here, while well, he's somewhere else. You know that sort of thing. You don't think he'll come, then? No fear. Run his head into the lion's mouth? Why, the room is bristling with the detectives and high officials. You don't know much about King Victor if you think that would deter him. By all accounts, it's the kind of situation he loves above all, and he always managed to come out on top.
Mr. Eversley shook his head doubtfully. That would take some time doing. With the dice loaded against him, he'll never. The door opened again and Treadwell announced, Mr. Cade. Anthony came straight across to his host. Lord Carterham, he said, I'm giving you a frightful lot of trouble and I'm awfully sorry about it, but I really do think that tonight we'll see the clearing up of the mystery. Lord Carterham looked mortified. Mollified, he had always had a secret liking for Anthony. No trouble at all, he said heartily. It's very kind of you, said Anthony. We're all here, I see. Then I can get on with the good work. I don't understand, said George Lomax. I don't understand in the least. This is all very irregular. Mr. Cade has no standing, no standing whatever. The position is a very difficult and delicate one. I am strongly of the opinion George's flood of eloquence was arrested. Moving unobtrusively to the great man's side, Superintendent Battle was... Anthony ignored the palpable condensation of the other's tone. It's just a little idea of mine, that's all, he said cheerfully. Probably all of you know that we got a hold of a certain message in Cypher the other day. There was a reference to Richmond and some numbers. He paused. Well, we had a shot at solving it and we failed. Now, in the late Count Stalpich's me memoirs, which I happen to have read, there is a reference to a certain dinner, a flower dinner, which everyone attended wearing a badge representing a flower. The Count himself wore the exact duplicate of that curious device we found in the cavity in the secret passage. It represented a rose. If you remember, it was all rows of things, buttons, letter E's, and finally rows of knitting. Now, gentlemen, what is there in this house that is arranged in rows? Books. Isn't that so? And to that, that in the catalog of Lord Catterman's library, there's a book called The Life of the Earl of Richmond. And I think you will get a very fair idea of the hiding place. Starting at the volume in question and using the numbers to denote shelves and books, I think you will find that the object of our search is concealed in a dummy book or in a cavity behind a particular book. Anthony looked around modestly, obviously waiting for applause. Upon my word, that's very ingenious, said Lord Carterham. Quite ingenious, admitted George condescendingly, but it remains to be seen. Anthony laughed. The proof of the pudding's in the eating, eh? Well, I'll soon settle that for you. He sprang to his feet. I'll go to the library. He got no further. M. Lemoyne moved forward from the window. Just one moment, Mr. Cade. You permit, Lord Carterham? He went to the writing table and hurriedly scribbled a few lines. He sealed them up in an envelope and then rang the bell. Treadwell appeared in answer to it. Lemoyne handed him the note. See, that is a delivered at once, if you please. Very good, sir, said Treadwell. With his usual dignified tread, he withdrew. Anthony, who had been standing irresolute, sat down again. What's the big idea, Lemoyne? he asked gently. There was a sudden sense of strain in the atmosphere. If the jewel is where you say it is, well, it has been there for over seven years. A quarter of an hour more does not matter. Go on, said Anthony. That wasn't all you wanted to say. No, it was not. At this juncture, it is unwise to permit any one person to leave the room, especially if that person has rather questionable antecedents. Anthony raised his eyebrows and lighted a cigarette. I suppose a vagabond life is not very respectable, he mused. Two months ago, Mr. Cade, you were in South Africa. That is admitted. Where were you before that? Anthony leaned back in his chair, idly blowing smoke rings. Canada, Wild Northwest, are you sure you are not in prison? A French prison? Automatically, Superintendent Battle moved and stepped nearer to the door, as if to cut off a retreat that way, but Anthony showed no signs of doing anything dramatic. Instead, he stared at the French detective and then burst out laughing. My poor Lemoyne! It is a monomania with you. You do indeed see King Victor everywhere. So you fancy that I am an interesting gentleman? Do you deny it? Anthony brushed a fleck of ash from his coat sleeve. I never deny anything that amuses me, he said lightly. But the accusation is really too ridiculous. Ah, you think so? The Frenchman leant forward. His face was twitching painfully, and yet he seemed perplexed and baffled, as though something in Anthony's manner puzzled him. 
What if I tell you, Monsieur, that this time, this time, I am out to get King Victor and nothing shall stop me? Very laudable, was Anthony's comment. You've been out to get him before, though, haven't you, Lemoyne? And he's got the better of you. Aren't you afraid that that may happen again? He's a slippery fellow by all accounts. The conversation had developed into a duel between the detective and Anthony. Everyone else in the room was conscious of the tension. It was a fight to finish. Between the Frenchman, painfully in earnest, and the man who spoke so calmly and whose words seemed to show that he had not a care in the world. If I were you, Lemoyne, continued Anthony, I should be very, very careful. Watch your step and all that sort of thing. This time, said Lemoyne grimly, there will be no mistake. You seem very sure about it all, said Anthony, but there's such a thing as evidence, you know. Lemoyne smiled and said, You ask me? Who murdered Prince Michael, he cried. I won't tell you. I'll show you. That whistle was the signal I've been waiting for. The murderer of Prince Michael is in the library now. He sprang out through the window, and the others followed him as he led the way around the terrace until they came to the library window. He pushed the window, and it yielded to his touch. Very softly, he held aside the thick velvet curtain so that they could look